Okay, welcome to Module 4, Objective 4. Uh, this time around, we're going to be looking at how to create data using aerial photography. And there's a lot of words on these slides, so I'm going to try my best not to read them, but I'll probably end up reading a few of them out, so we'll just kind of play along with that. Um, so some of the, the, the two objectives of this is defining georeferencing and then digitizing features on a georeferenced image. So there is something called a geometric transformation, and this is when we're trying to um, convert our map or like our, our image to a map. And so we use like actual map features and those coordinates that are there to kind of project my information or my 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 image to that map. So they they need to be converted to a projected coordinate system. Um, so if you have a map that happens to be in latitude and longitude, we need to project it so that it's flat on a flat surface. And then you can take your image and try to adjust it so that it's on that projected surface. So usually what we do to do to get this to work is to use something called uh, ground control points, which is what I call them. Um, but they just call them control points here. And um, and then we use something called a transformation equation. So this is just, it allows us to take any kind of digitized map, a satellite image, aerial photo, anything that doesn't have a coordinate system, we can kind of force it into a coordinate system using these two things. So the geometric transformation can also include the correction of errors and specifically geometric errors. So they give an example of satellite sensor motion here uh, that is, that's one of them. Of course, there's always distortion from lenses and atmospheric effects, and there's all kinds of extra errors, but we're not going to get into them into too much detail in this course. That's actually for your remote sensing course. Um, but there's algorithms that we can use to kind of reduce the, these errors, and, um, and then we use these transformation equations to get the coordinates. And so it's very, very mathematical, very heavy in math. We won't get into them <laughs> in this class, but the get the, to get the overview of it is what's, uh, really, what's really important. So the geometric transformation includes two different kinds. There's map to map, and then there's also an image to map. So a map to map would be taking a scanned map and then transforming those, that scanned map into coordinates. There's also image to map, which is when you're taking a, an, an image um, or like a satellite image or aerial image, and you convert all the rows and columns to a projected coordinate, so a coordinate system. So the, both of them need control points, and that's what we use in order to put into the model. So what I mean by a control point is that I find one feature on my image, I find one feature on my map, and I say, and it's the same feature, and I kind of put a play point there, and then I find another one, and then I put another points there on both of them. And then what you do is just kind of attach them. Okay, I'm gonna move this point on my image on top of my, my map, and make sure those points match up. So once we've done that, then we can use the, the measurement um, of that and how effective it is by using the RMS error. So this actually measures displacement because you can't perfectly make it fit. Um, I'd like to use an example of rubber on like you have a piece of wood with some nails on it and you have a piece of rubber and you have two pictures on the same like of the same on the rubber and on the, wo the wood. And when you take that rubber and you place it onto those nails, you're gonna use those nails as your con control points. So as you push it down, you're gonna see that it elongates a little bit or might be kind of bunched up in some points. And that, that is the displacement of these, these control point locations. So as you're stretching it and it makes little holes, that RMS is the hole that you're gonna see. And then once you have a good enough RMS value, then you can do the transformation. So we actually, um, th there's actually a five-step process to this, and th they don't go over it in the PowerPoints here, but you collect your ground control points as step one. Your step two is actually calculating the transformation equation, and that transformation equation is what allows you to calculate the RMS value. So step three is now iterating 
your ground control points and recalculating the transformation equation to be able to reduce down that RMS value. Then once you've got that, then you, we do something called resampling, which is where you're actually converting the entire, all of the rows and all the pixels to that location so that you can view it on a computer screen. And then you, at the very end, you evaluate it. So the actual transformation equation itself, uh, there's a few different ways to do it. So there's equa area, or equa area. Um, that allows for rotation, but it keeps size and shape. So there's no, it, it's like as if it stays static, you just rotate it. Uh, there's also the similarity equation, which allows, ro um, allows rotation, but it not size. So it kind of applies a, um, so it allows rotation, preserves shape, as it says, and not size. So it allows for like a scale factor to adjust that entire image. Then there's the affine transformation method, and that allows for the angular distortion, but preserves parallelism. So what that means is I can rotate it, and the shapes might change a little bit because maybe one end is more like converging versus the bottom. But lines that go straight north according to the UTM, are still going to stay going straight north, for example. Then there's projective transformation method, which allows for both angular and length distortion, so you could end up with some really interesting looking images. And then there's topological, which just means that everything stays connected in, in, based on the, the rules that are in place, but it might look totally different once you've actually transformed it. So here's a couple examples. So you can see equa area is just rotating a square to look like a diamond. Similarity means it's square, and you got you could have a diamond that's rotated, but it's much smaller. Affine means you can go from a square to a parallelogram. Um, projective means that I've got my square, and then I've maybe it's now going to be a trapezoid, where the topological goes from a square to a circle. <laughs> So those are just some of the distortions you're going to see with that. So going into a little bit more detail about the control points, these are really, really important in determining the accuracy of, well, it says an affine transformation, but in any transformation that you choose. So as you select the control points, they also call them ticks. Um, it, it's pretty straightforward you need to know points with actual real-world coordinates. So whatever you're using to georeference to needs to already have been georeferenced. So, excuse me, I can sneeze. All right, so as you go through, um, we, like I said at the beginning, I call them ground control points because they are already in real-world coordinates, but in the image coordinates, all it know, or image coordinates, all it knows is rows and columns. So it only knows, like, I'm in row 6, column 5, and that's all it can read. So we need to be able to take all of those, co those image coordinates in rows and columns and then convert those into the real-world coordinates themselves. So GCP is short for ground control point, and we select them directly in the image, and the selection is not as straightforward as selecting four ground control points for a digitized map, or ticks for a digitized map, um, it, because you, you need to keep some key things in mind. So an affine transformation requires a minimum of three, ideally four. It still really is not enough. Um, the selection for ground control points for image transformation requires that points are clearly visible on the image. So if you're using the side of a building or like the bottom of a building and in the image it's actually shifted because there is some um, like leaning out from the center of the image, then you're, it's not very clearly visible. So then you're kind of guessing where that bottom of the building is. So something very clear like the, like a corner of an intersection um, or, or something, you know, Maybe there's some lines that cross and you can see that intersection or a point like a, at, at the end of a peninsula, as long as water hasn't made any changes. Because <laughs> that's another thing is that if it changes over time, it's not a good, good um, thing to go by. It does say small water features that are identifiable. It's good as long as there's no water changes. Um, the Mackenzie Delta is a really good example of changing area all the time, so you wouldn't want to do that. 
it says ideally at least four and I'm going to go back to that because in um, in geomatics in order to do a proper transformation you need a minimum of 15 so and and that's what what will improve your accuracy it may not improve the RMS but overall it's going to improve the visual outcome and also because you have so much more redundancy in the image it actually improves the accuracy RMS is only a small measure it's actually a biased measure of the accuracy so these real real world coordinates um, are then are if we go out and we actually collect the data ourselves we can have GPS or we can have pre-made maps so we already know what the coordinates are or we can use reports and bring in text files so we can get that from anywhere um, then we need some good imagery that requires on the ground points so if we can put a target out and we place them and then we can fly over in if you're in here in Calgary sometimes you'll see big white circles with a black dot in the center that is a control point for um, for aerial photos and so with high definition imagery we can use that so we talked about um, georeferencing and it's just taking an unknown photograph and putting it into a known location and then we can use different georeferencing methods which we didn't talk about these ones in this particular um, PowerPoint so it's not necessary but nearest neighbor cubic convolution and bilinear interpolation um, those are based on the what we call this the resampling which we didn't get into in this particular um, PowerPoint so I find it interesting that it's in the summary <laughs> there's also a georeferencing toolbar that allows you to georeference air, air photos and so you're gonna have a chance to do that but I, let me just talk about these for a second because even though it's in the summary I think it's important that I talk about them so the nearest neighbor the idea behind the nearest neighbor is that it's going to take the pixel value so um, so we have a, a screen and you're going to picture that as your computer screen and the computer screen has a standardized way of representing pixels now if I rotate an image at a weird angle or at any angle and I, other than 90 degrees and then suddenly those pixels don't line up so in order for the pixels to line up with the screen I need to find a way to make those values as a square so that's what these three do and that's what resampling does so the idea behind the nearest neighbor is that it's actually using the rotated value so that's like the actual data value and it's going to put it into the pixel and the pixel is the one that is your, the, the value you use is the one that's closest to the center of the screen pixel that makes sense <laughs> and it works so much better with a diagram here um, so it, you just rotate it and the the pixel of the data that is rotated that takes up the most or closest to the center of the the screen pixel is what the screen pixel is going to display um, bilinear interpolation means that it's going to take a weighted average of the pixels that are touching and surrounding pixels that are touching that um, single screen pixel uh, and so it applies bilinear interpolation which is a type of mathematical calculation and then cubic convolution is a lot more complicated it takes about 16 pixels that are around it and um, it applies some uh, a conversion into the frequency domain and then does some multiplication there and then sends it back to the spatial domain and then you got a number so, so so both cubic convolution and bilinear interpolation do not give the exact same number it's some sort of weighted value that you're going to be viewing where nearest neighbor is, is the actual value but nearest neighbor causes it to look like it's pixelated where cubic convolution and bilinear interpolation make a much smoother more natural looking image so that's what those are I don't know why they don't have a PowerPoint slide on that but that's what they are <laughs> so, um, so the georeferencing toolbar contains functionality um, for you to georeference I think I mentioned that already so there is the web page in ArcGIS um, uh, or on Esri's ArcGIS page and you can see how to do that and it walks you through quite nicely so just this goes to assignment two there's my references and thank you so much